This is Radio Equal Shock with your host, Alex Smith. Stay tuned for the latest from the young Swedish climate action inspiration Greta Thunberg. But first, this short report from Brazil. Their own Donald Trump, newly elected President Jair Bolsonaro, is whipping up land grabbers in the Amazon and encouraging violence. There have been three massacres of native Amazonians in the last few weeks, while environmental laws are being tossed out the window. Here is the latest. Radio Ecoshock. Climate change threatens to destroy the vast Amazon rainforest of South America. But Brazilians may still do it first. Everything from biodiversity, human rights, to rainfall in Africa is at risk. Let's go to one of the most experienced correspondents covering the Amazon. Sue Branford became a journalist in Brazil, reporting for the Financial Times and The Economist. She was Latin America editor for the BBC for 15 years and still returns to Brazil for The Times, The Guardian, and Manga Bay. From London, Sue Branford, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you, Alex. It's a lovely to talk to you. We don't get much news out of the Amazon. Sue, tell us about your latest story for Manga Bay. Well, I think the Amazon should be covered more because I think what happens in the Amazon is going to affect us all in the world. It's an enormous forest. It covers 2 million square miles, the biggest forest in the world, contains a fifth of the world's drinking water. And I think, really, the the fate of the planet is going to be decided in in the Amazon. And I was back in the Amazon earlier this year, and I was really quite shocked at the rate of devastation. I first reported, as you said, from the Amazon back in the 1970s when I was working for the Financial Times when Brazil was ruled by a military dictatorship. And there was a lot of destruction going on then. But it seemed that after Brazil emerged from the dictatorship in 1985 and then had a really progressive new constitution in 1988, that the corner had been turned that Brazil was beginning a new era in which it was going to respect the biodiversity of the Amazon. It was going to respect the people that lived in the Amazon. But unfortunately, in the last three years, a lot of this progress has been overturned, and particularly over the last few months, when Brazil has got a very right-wing president, Jair Bolsonaro, who is a fan of the military and is going back to adopting a lot of those out dated policies that the military implemented, and it's causing an awful lot of violence. The latest story I wrote on the Amazon was just a a, a couple of weeks ago, which was about a series of massacres. We're beginning to have landless peasants, indigenous people being massacred on the very edge of the agribusiness frontier that is penetrating the forest. And very little of this is even reported in the Brazilian press. We're getting real impunity, violence. The, the atmosphere is, is dreadful on the, in the Amazon now. And it's become a very violent place, a, a very dangerous place for environmentalists, for activists, for journalists. One of the most dangerous places in the world. I mean, I can go in and out because I'm a foreigner. I don't stay long. But the journalists who are reporting on the ground, the people who are talking to us, They are suffering threats. They are running the risk of their lives, and people are being killed. But the new Brazilian Minister of Infrastructure sounds rational about building better roads and railways into the Amazon. What's the threat there? Yes, we we interviewed the new Minister of of Infrastructure, and he is very rational and he's very well informed, but it is an outdated concept that he has. He's gone back to the concept of development that comes from the 1970s, when the military were in power, when nature was seen as an enemy. Nature was seen as something that had to be tamed, the the trees had to be cut down, you had to have big development projects, you had to have roads, you you had to have dams, you had to have mining projects. You had to harness the wealth of the forest for the development of Brazil. And we know now that this is very short-sighted, that if we go ahead with this model of development, which the current government is, we're going to destroy the world. I, I mean, we need these forests. We've learned an awful lot. The scientists have learned an awful lot over the last 40 years. 
They know that the Amazon plays a key role in regulating the climate, in producing oxygen, in harnessing the, the whole process of the way the climate works. And we start interfering with this we could actually destroy the forest. Something like 20% of the, or just under 20% of the forest has been felled. And if we, they, the scientists now think that if something like 25%, a quarter of the forest is felled, then we're going to spark off, we're going to have a, a turning point, we're going to turn this forest into a savanna. And once the forest starts dying, then it's going to upset the world climate catastrophically. And this is something we should not be doing. Apart from, of course, if you go on cutting down the forest, you're generating a lot of greenhouse gases just because of the trees that, that when they rot, uh, produce a lot of these greenhouse gases. And we, I think there's a growing awareness in the world now that we need to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that we produce. Well, we're already really on a process of very alarming climate change. And we've got to reduce these, the, the production of these greenhouse gases. And one of the first steps, surely, that we should be doing is stopping cutting down trees. This is the sort of easy fruit that we can pick. And yet the rate at which the forest has been felled has picked up alarmingly over the last two or three years. Sue, has the massive dream of damming most of the Amazon rivers for electricity been scaled back or called off? Well, again, um, we thought it had been, but with the new government, they're talking about picking up this program again. I mean, when I was first in Brazil, it seemed a very good idea to sort of dam these rivers and produce energy. But now we know that these big dams in tropical conditions cause quite serious environmental problems, and they also disrupt the lives of many indigenous communities. And one of the things that has become very clear over the last few decades, the best people for preserving, protecting the forest are the indigenous groups. If you fly over eastern Amazonia now, which is the most devastated area, often you're flying over areas which are devastated brown, a lot of felled areas, and then you come across what looks like an island of green. And almost inevitably, that is an indigenous reserve. They have over millennia, thousands of years, they've learned how to coexist with the forest, to use the wealth of the forest, and yet to protect it. To, to make sure it's in a healthy state. And in fact, they need the forest to be in a healthy state for their culture, for their way of life to be preserved. And when you start having these big projects, the, the, the dams and the, and the mining projects, um, the, uh, their way of life, their communities are, are very seriously harmed. And I think one of the things we're seeing now that the Indians themselves are getting more organized and more determined to stop these big projects. There recently there was a big dam, Belo Monte, on the Shingu River that was completed. It's the third largest hydroelectric dam in the world. And uh, before it was built, the authorities went in and assured the Indians that their way of life would be protected, although the dam was quite close they wouldn't really suffer any big impact. But now the Indians are seeing that, that this was wrong, that their, their rivers have, have, um, are greatly impoverished, that there's, there's, they can't go on hunting. They, the, the, their whole way of life has been disturbed. I mean, they're not going hungry. The government is coming and giving them food parcels. So this is not how the Indians want to live. And very sadly, some of these indigenous communities, you have a, quite a high rate of obesity and of, of Western diseases, of, of cancer, of overweight, of, of the, the whole kind of illness that we in the West suffer from. And the Indians are quite horrified to see that some of their communities have these problems. And they, they are now adamant that they're not going to let the authorities go ahead and go back to this old ambitious program of building big dams and opening big mineral projects. But this is what the new uh, government of Jair Bolsonaro wants. He is an open fan of, uh, he's quite, um, uh, uh, he, he says 
repeatedly that he's a fan of the military. And many people sort of thought that this was a sort of an exaggerate, exaggeration, that he didn't really mean it. But now we actually see that he did mean it, that I mean, he is very hard line. He, he, he wants to get the Indians off the land. He's gone back to that old kind of um, army rhetoric of, of the, the objective is to integrate, to assimilate the Indians. And a lot of the ministers in his new government are saying that the Indians have got to become Brazilians. They've got to give up their way of life, their culture, and they've, they've got to become one of us. And, I mean, this is a very short sighted of view, and it was something we Brazilians thought they'd left behind with this new constitution in 1988, which explicitly said that recognized that the Indians were the original inhabitants of Brazil and they had the right to their land and that the Indians had a right to their own way of life, to their own culture, to their, to their own language. And there was a recognition of the enormous benefits that this brings to Brazil, but both in terms of increasing the complexity, the cultural wealth of the country, but also in terms of environmental protection and of, of, of defending, protecting the environment. So it's been quite a shock now to have a sort of president in power who explicitly is rejecting this and going back to, to very different, outdated views. Yes, those are the views we had in Canada. We were going to make all the First Nations people into white people. We took away their children and put them in residential schools. It ended up being a kind of genocide for them. And, of course, the same thing happened in the United States in the 1800s, early 1900s. A terrible path to go down and, and terrible news to hear. Now, you recently wrote for Monga Bay about the big state of Rondonia in northern Brazil. Tell us about the seesaw struggle to protect at least some of nature there. Well, Rondonia is on the very west of the Amazon border. It's a very remote area. And the news filters out very slowly there. And it's an area which has a lot of mineral wealth, um, has a lot of trees. And now that we've got a government in power that has said that it's not really going to make sure the law is respected, that it's going to not take action if, if land grabbers and farmers go in. We've had cases of, of farmers moving in and land grabbers moving in and actually intimidating and killing some of the inhabitants there and some of the Indians there. What we're seeing now is the worst cases of violence occurring on the very edge of the Amazon frontier, uh, where you've got, first of all, the loggers moving in, trying to take out the good timber, and then behind them, you've got the land grabbers who go in and sort of uh, and fell the forest, and once it's cleared, they then sell it on to ranches, and then behind them is agribusiness. And... There's long been conflicts between these incomers and the traditional inhabitants who are trying to cling on to their land, and also landless peasants who, in many of these areas, have have now got land settlements authorised by the government. But the land grabbers want to get their hands on this land again. And one of the other things that is happening that there have been promises by the government they're going to build first of all, a big new road that would go right across the South America into Peru and um, join up with the ocean there. So we'll have Brazil, we'll have the whole of Latin America traversed by a road. And this, of course, is leading to an increase in land values because now that farmers and loggers can see that they can get their products to the market much more quickly, they want to get their hands on this land. And there's been resistance both by traditional communities of Brazil nuts uh, collectors of, of, of peasant farmers and of the Indians who really uh, are, are struggling to hold on to their land. And it, the agribusiness which is driving it all is very powerful and now it's the most powerful force in the Brazilian political scene. It dominates both the executive and the legislative arms of government. It's become much more powerful in the last couple of years because it was through its the support of this rural lobby in Congress. First of all, the president uh, was impeached in 2016, and now President Bolsonaro was elected. 
so they they are very powerful in Congress. So they're pushing ahead uh, at full speed with a lot of these destructive policies that under earlier governments had gone more slowly and there had been more effective opposition. And I also think that the agribusiness lobby is fearful that the Bolsonaro government is fairly unstable. I mean, he's been in power for just over 100 days, and he's, the opinion polls are showing that support for him is falling very rapidly. I think he was one of these, perhaps a little bit like Trump, that he came across to the Brazilian voter as somebody authentic, who spoke off the cuff, who wasn't a traditional politician, that was somebody in some way real. And so they voted for him. But a lot of his views don't really chime with the majority views of, of most Brazilians. Most Brazilians are in favor of, of preserving biodiversity, are in favor of allowing the Indians to stay on, to, on their land. So they're finding that they are out of step um, with the president. Of course, he has got important supporters who are still backing him. But there's a growing number of Brazilians who are feeling uncomfortable with, with his rhetoric, with the way in which he's sort of justifying going it for landlords. He says landowners should uh, arm themselves and go in and get rid of um, people who, the, the, whose land they want. He's, he's quite openly espousing these views which really uh, don't get an awful lot of support with Brazilians. So I think agribusiness is trying very hard to push ahead with measures that it's wanted for years, things like allowing big mining companies onto indigenous land to allow agribusiness onto indigenous land. So we're seeing the momentum of bills going through Congress, of change, going very fast at the moment. And I think it is driven by this feeling that this is a window of opportunity for agribusiness, and they've got to go seize their opportunity because it may not last very long. But it is extremely worrying because the amount of damage that they can do in these months, years that they're in power is extraordinary. And um, I mean, I just read today a scientist saying if the way that they're allowing land grabbers and landowners onto the forest land now, we may see just by 2030 that over half of the Amazon forest has been felled. And if, if we get to that point, then we're going to have a major disruption in the um, global climate. And this is why I think it is what is going on in the Amazon is really important for all of us because it's if we just have this sort of rampant destruction of the forest in the Amazon, then the whole problem of controlling climate change, of, of stopping the, the world on this, what seems to be at the moment a fairly sort of headlong gallop into uncontrollable uh, climatic change, it, 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 all that's going to become much more difficult. Following reporting from mongabay.com, we've been getting an update from seasoned Brazil correspondent Sue Branford. Find links to her latest story in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org. Sue, thank you so much for talking with us. A pleasure, Alex. Check out the Radio Ecoshock website. We're at ecoshock.org. <laughs>